Grigory Rasputin. A Russian monk with a claimed ability to heal the sick, he even went as far as to say that he's the second coming of Christ. He joined the weird group Kalisti, an orthodox sect known for its bizarre rituals. He manipulated the royal Russian family into making them believe he was a holy man. This is Pokrovskoy, a small village in Siberia. Here, in the 21 of January 1869, a child was born to two parents. His name is Grigory Yefimovich Rasputin. The couple had seven children before Grigory, all of whom died in infancy and early childhood. But Grigory survived. He didn't receive any education in his childhood or teenage years. But when Grigory became a teenager, a fire broke out in his family house. He survived the fire, but unfortunately, his mother died. His dad died to a disease. Grigory and his brother were playing near the river, but the river swept away both him and his brother, which led to the death of his brother. When he became 17 years old, he got married. Although the couple had four children, Rasputin still cheated on his wife. But oddly, his wife didn't leave him, even though she knew about it. Some time later in the future, Rasputin had stolen a horse, but the horse owners caught him. So he left the village to escape punishment for the horse theft. After he left the village, he decided to get religious. So he joined the church, and the priests taught him the Orthodox Christianity, and he became religious. At that point of time, rumors have spread, mostly by him, among people around him that he had healing powers, and he started to visit the sick and he would start healing them. By surprise, a lot of the people he visited actually got better. Historians explained that this was due to his charisma and his focus on the psychological side of the sick, by reassuring them and comforting them, and given that it was the early 1900s, people didn't care much about the psychological effects like anxiety and pessimism. Nevertheless, this tactic gave Rasputin a very big reputation, the monk who could heal the sick. At that point of time, Rasputin started his pilgrimage journey, visiting numerous villages, and before he would arrive at a village, his reputation would get there before him as the blessed monk who could heal people. But he didn't like this lifestyle of religious people. This perverted person wanted a more deviant lifestyle. And somehow he managed to get into a weird religious group of the Orthodox Church, a group called the Kalisti. This sect's ecstatic rituals were rumored to include self-flagellation and sexual parties. The Kalisti aimed to get closer to their God by this perversion Anyways, the reputation of Rasputin was getting bigger and spreading along the Russian Empire as he traveled to more and more villages. At this time in the Russian Empire, Tsar Nicholas II was the ruler of the Russian Empire. Nicholas became the Tsar after the sudden death of his father, Alexander III. But his father failed to prepare Nicholas to become the Tsar. At the beginning of his reign, Nicholas was hugely influenced by his uncle Sergei Alexandrovich. On 1884, Sergei was married to Princess Elizabeth Feodorovna, daughter of Louis IV, Grand Duke of Hesse. Nicholas was 16 years old at that time. He met with and fell in love with the bride's youngest sister, 12-year-old Princess Alexandra Feodorovna. Alexandra had feelings for him in turn. Nicholas stated his desire to marry Alexandra. Nicholas' offer was accepted and supported by his uncle and his wife. On 20th of April 1894, Nicholas and Alexandra became officially engaged. Alexandra considered herself a religious woman. This was a big reason why she fell in love with Nicholas in the first place, 
as he shared the same interest in religion as her. Keep this piece of information in mind as it played a major role in Rasputin's accession to the royal family. After their marriage, in the same year, the Tsar Alexander III died. So Nicholas had to become the Tsar and rule the empire. On the 27th of May, 1896, a large festival with food, free beer and souvenir cups was held in Kodinka Field outside Moscow. Kodinka was primarily used as a military training ground and the field was uneven with trenches. Before the food and drinks were handed out, rumors spread that there would not be enough for everyone. As a result, the crowd rushed to get their share and individuals were tripped and trampled upon, suffocating in the dirt of the field of the approximate 500,000 in attendance. It is estimated that 13 to 89 individuals died and roughly between 2,000 to 20,000 were injured. The mourning populace saw Nicholas as frivolous and uncaring. Ten years later, Nicholas and Alexandra had four daughters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia. But to them, this wasn't a pleasant thing as they wanted a son to be their heir to the throne. And on the 12th of August, 1904, they had a son and named him Alexei. Unfortunately, he was born with haemophilia. Nicholas II and his wife decided not to reveal their son's disease. The Tsar had another problem. Ever since the Romanov family ruled the Russian Empire, every Tsar would expand the empire, and Nicholas had his eyes on Japan. He thought it was an easy target. But in 1904, the Russo-Japanese War began and the Imperial Russian Navy was the strongest of the Russian army. The Russian Navy was surprised by the faster and stronger battleships of the Japanese Navy. And Russia lost almost every battle of this war, which led to the inevitable surrender of the Russian Empire. At that time, Rasputin was still on his pilgrimage journey with his reputation ahead of him. He arrived at St. Petersburg, the Russian capital at the time, and met with the priest of the biggest church in the town. He's a close friend to the royal family, of course. The priest and everyone in the church welcomed Rasputin. People began to meet with Rasputin. Even noble people wanted to meet Rasputin and see for themselves the acclaimed healing powers he had. The Tsar and his wife couldn't handle the situation. Anxiety and stress had peaked and the Tsarevich's health kept deteriorating. But outside the walls of their palace, things weren't good either. The Russian Empire is losing the wars and battles on different fronts. People were starving due to the lack of food and supplies and the country's focus on the wars. Political parties have formed in favor of overthrowing the Tsar and the royal family. But none of the Tsar consultants told him about what's happening, so he didn't think much of it. On Sunday 9th January 1905, a march has begun. Locking arms, the workers marched peacefully through the streets. Some carried religious icons and banners, as well as national flags and portraits of the Tsar. As they walked, they sang hymns and God Save the Tsar. At 2 p.m., all of the converging processions were scheduled to arrive at the Winter Palace, there was no single confrontation with the troops. Throughout the city, at bridges on strategic boulevards, the marchers found their way blocked by lines of infantry and the soldiers opened fire on the crowd. The official number of victims was 92 dead and several hundred wounded. The leaders of the march were seized. Expelled from the capital, they circulated through the empire, increasing the casualties. As bullets riddled their icons, their banners and their portraits of Nicholas, the people shrieked, the Tsar will not help us. People lost faith in the Tsar after what happened. A lot had joined the revolutionary parties. On the 17th of February, 1905, Grand Duke Sergei Romanov left unaccompanied for the Governor General's mansion. The arrival of the Grand Duke's recognizable carriage, drawn by a pair of horses and driven by his coachman Andrei Rudinkin, alerted the terrorist who had been waiting in the Kremlin with a bomb wrapped in newspapers. Just before 1445, the carriage of the Grand Duke passed through the gate of Nikolskaya Tower of the Kremlin. From a distance no more than four feet away, the terrorist stepped forward 
and threw a nitroglycerin bomb directly into Sergei's lap. The explosion disintegrated the carriage and the Grand Duke died immediately. Nicholas was surprised by the death of his uncle. Now he understands the extent of the revolution and the anger of the people. Under pressure from the attempted 1905 Russian Revolution, on the 5th of August of that year, Nicholas II issued a manifesto about the convocation of the Stade Duma, known as the Bulligin Duma. In the October manifesto, the Tsar pledged to introduce basic civil liberties, provide for broad participation in the State Duma, and endow the Duma with legislative and oversight powers. He was determined, however, to preserve his autocracy even in the context of reform. During the same period, Tsarevich Alexei fell and injured his leg. Although the wound was not significant, due to his illness, the blood continued to flow. His health deteriorated and he became weak in bed. His parents sought the best doctors in the city, but they couldn't find a solution. The doctors could only provide pain-relieving medications. The Tsar and Tsarina heard from close associates in the noble class that there was a blessed monk named Rasputin who could heal people. Rasputin was summoned to the palace by Tsar Nicholas. He entered Alexei's room and approached the bed. He placed his hand on the prince's head and began his rituals. Surprisingly, in the days that followed, Prince Alexei's condition improved significantly. This was a physical illness, not just a psychological condition. How did Rasputin treat him? The explanation for what happened is that Rasputin stopped the doctor's treatments. They were administering aspirin, which is very dangerous for hemophilia patients as it reduces blood clotting, weakening the condition instead of improving it. It was not due to blessings, magic or anything else. It was simply a coincidence. From that moment on, Rasputin became an indispensable member of the royal entourage. As each day passed, Rasputin's impact and influence on the Tsar and Tsarina increased. At that time, protests resumed and the people rose again when they discovered that the Duma, established by the Tsar, was just a facade and all decisions still rested in his hands. There was no improvement in the country. The situation was chaotic, with protests everywhere. The army killed people in the streets, hundreds were executed, and destructive acts, bombings and widespread destruction occurred throughout Russia. Felix Yusupov, an aristocrat from an extremely wealthy family in Russia, married to the Tsar's niece. Felix contacted Rasputin, expressing a desire to meet him. Although Rasputin felt a bit uneasy, Refusing a noble invitation like Felix's would be strange. Nobles seeking his therapeutic help were common. Rasputin responded to Felix, agreeing to meet the next evening. The following day, Prince Felix and his assistants prepared tea and cakes to welcome Rasputin. Unbeknownst to Rasputin, it would be laced with cyanide. Felix intended to kill him. Rasputin arrived at the palace and Felix led him to one of the rooms where they had prepared tea and cakes. Felix invited him to sit and said, Feel free to take whatever you want. He began pouring the poisoned tea. Inexplicably, Rasputin kept drinking and eating, showing no signs of poisoning. It was puzzling because the poison should have acted immediately. Felix observed in amazement as Rasputin continued to consume the poisoned items without any apparent effect. Finally, perplexed, Felix excused himself from Rasputin and went to his assistants waiting outside. He told them what he had seen and they said to him, You have to kill him yourself. Felix returned with a gun and found Rasputin still unharmed. Rasputin looked surprised as Felix aimed the gun at his chest and fired a shot. Rasputin fell to the ground immediately. The conspirators then drove to Rasputin's apartment, with one of them wearing Rasputin's coat in an attempt to make it look as though Rasputin had returned home that night. Upon returning to his palace, Yusupov went back to the basement to ensure that Rasputin was dead. Suddenly, Rasputin leaped up and attacked Yusupov, who freed himself with some effort and fled upstairs. 
Rasputin fled to the palace's courtyard, where he was shot again. The conspirators then wrapped his body in cloth, drove it to the Petrovsky Bridge, and dropped it into the Little Nevka River. The February Revolution of 1917 resulted in the abdication of Nicholas II in favour of his brother, Grand Duke Michael Alexandrovich. Michael deferred to the will of the people and acknowledged the provisional government as the de facto executive, but neither abdicated nor refused to accept the throne, effectively terminating the Romanov dynasty's rule over Russia. After the February Revolution, Nicholas II and his family were placed under house arrest in the Alexander Palace. While several members of the imperial family managed to stay on good terms with the provisional government and were eventually able to leave Russia, Nicholas II and his family were sent into exile in the Siberian town of Tobolsk by Alexander Kerensky in August 1917. In the October Revolution of 1917, the Bolsheviks ousted the provisional government. In April 1918, the Romanovs were moved to the Russian town of Yekaterinburg in the Urals, where they were placed in the Apatyev house. Late on the night of 16th of July 1918, Nicholas, Alexandra, their five children and four servants were ordered to dress quickly and go down to the cellar of the house in which they were being held. There, the family and servants were arranged in two rows for a photograph they were told was being taken to quell rumors that they had escaped. Suddenly, a dozen armed men burst into the room and gunned down the imperial family in a hail of gunfire. Those who were still breathing when the smoke cleared were stabbed to death. The execution lasted about 20 minutes. Future investigations calculated that a possible 70 bullets were fired, roughly seven bullets per shooter, of which 57 were found in the basement and at all three subsequent grave sites. This video took over three weeks of our lives to make, so if you've liked the video, please consider subscribing and liking it. Watch this video we've made about a dark web drug lord, and I promise you won't regret it.